I'm a visualization. Oops, continue. I'm a visualization scientist for NASA's Chandrax Observatory. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I get to do for work and also just kind of take questions. I, I'm happy for this to be conversational since we're a more intimate group. Um, I always like to start out by talking about my background because it's not like a stereotypical uh, background that people expect for someone who's working in astronomy. I actually started out in molecular biology, but by the time I got to be maybe a junior in college, I realized like I didn't want to stare through a microscope all the time. So I went into coding, taught myself a bunch of different languages, um, got a job teaching computer science at the university and just kind of like went full throttle. And then weirdly enough, ended up working in astronomy. So I just traded a microscope for a telescope completely accidentally. Um, and then the past 23 years, I've been just working in data visualization and imaging research primarily for one of NASA's great observatories, which was launched back in 1999. Um, it's pretty cool to be part of a mission that's getting ready to launch. I mean, the people that have spent their careers preparing for this mission, which was technologically very, very challenging to build. A lot of new technologies had to be created to even get to creating Chandra. And so, you know, strapping that onto a rocket and sending it into outer space is a very intense um, moment of time. But everything went beautifully and Chandra has been going about a third of the way to the moon, happily on its way doing its work, studying the X-ray universe ever since. Um, it really is uh, an amazing group and team to be a part of. Chandra is about the size of a school bus and because it was so heavy and was so massive, it actually made the launch even trickier but the astronauts and the ground engineers and all the scientists and everybody involved, like they really knew their stuff. They had everything figured out and, and everything just went beautifully. Um, so Chandra gets to study this high energy universe, which X-rays are actually emitted from many different objects in space, from exploding stars and areas around black holes to colliding galaxies and so much more. I thought it would be interesting for you to sort of see my my playpen of data, if you will. I get to essentially play in this big sandbox of data every day. And it's a true privilege to have A, such a well-organized archive, um, and B, such a, a, an interesting way to be able to put my my coding skills and my background in computer science to work. So we're gonna take a very quick tour on some of my favorite sites to see in the universe. These all include data from the Chandrax Observatory, but astronomy these days is very multi-wavelength or even multi-messenger, so more information than just light. And that means that when an astronomer is studying the universe, they tend to pick whichever tools they need to help best answer those questions. And um, those tools are all different kinds of light, whether it's the X-ray light that Chandra's looking at, or whether it's optical light that Hubble's getting to look at, or some other type of wavelength entirely. So uh, we're gonna start with some of my favorites, baby stars, where these tall pillars of gas and dust where stars are in the process of forming. Stars like to hang out in clusters. So we're lots of little star clusters where young stars are sort of learning their way through the world and eventually going out into the universe. Um, all different kinds of clusters of stars as they're both young and as they start to mature, you can see there's quite a difference in the way some of these star clusters look. Stars, of course, also get old. So now we're looking at an older, mature grouping of stars called a globular cluster. Some stars that are really massive are going to go out with a bang. And this image is one that I particularly like because it's not that far from Earth. And this object could explode sometime in our lifetimes or maybe not for another you know, thousand years. Who knows? Um, but if it does explode, it'll actually really give us a nice new uh, light to see in our night sky. And it'll be quite bright for us. That so will be safe from the radiation and all that. Uh, all different kinds of stars live all different kinds of lights and pretty much the fate of a star depends on its mass. So stars that are more medium sized like our sun, they eventually evolve into what's called a planetary nebula, which has nothing to do with planets. It's just an old name, um, old habits die hard, I guess. But 
This is an example of a planetary nebula. I'll show a few of them. This is one of my favorites called the cat's eye. You can see there's this core of this high energy gas in the purpley pink, and then all of these concentric rings and um, different kinds of jets and clumps that are kind of expanding out from it. But again, all different kinds of shapes and sizes from planetary nebulas as well. Now we're moving into some of my favorite objects in the entire universe, and that is supernova remnants. Uh, these are just very massive stars, way more massive than our sun, that have essentially grown old, run out of fuel, collapsed in on themselves, and then exploded. Or perhaps they were um, already a very sort of dense core in, in a situation where they're dancing with another star and they're pulling material off that other star and then also an explosion can happen. So there are different ways that stars can explode, but the end result is quite stunning. As you'll see, um, these supernova remnants, these this leftover debris fields from the stars that have gone on to another format are really stunning, but also very, very interesting. It's very interesting for us to understand the sort of chemical makeup of these exploded stars because the calcium in our bones, the iron in our blood, these different heavy elements, they're all created in stars either before they die or in something that happens during the explosion. And so it's really useful to know where all that material is coming from in the universe. So. Dead stars are really cool or hot, I suppose. Um, also really cool or hot would be things like black holes. And this is Sagittarius A star, which is the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So this one's really special for us. It's really important. Black holes have this reputation for being these like cosmic vacuum cleaners, these cosmic Roombas, but they actually do a lot of good in the universe too. They can be uh, agents of death, I suppose, um, but they can also be agents of recycling. And they are essentially the most fascinating and efficient ways of recycling in the universe. So there's lots of interesting and good stuff that can come out of a black hole. Well, the black hole jets, which is material that is not absorbed into the black hole itself. So this is another view of our very own supermassive black hole, which in the little bright patch on the right side. But black holes exist in many, many different galaxies. Most galaxies have a black hole at their central region. And you can see in some of these the bright white spots at the center is where a black hole would be hiding. So galaxies, of course, come in all different sizes and shapes from pinwheels and exclamation marks to cartwheels and rings and antennas and whirlpools. There's just a plethora of different kinds of interesting looks, whether it's a single galaxy that's quite young or whether it's an older galaxy that is in the process of merging with another galaxy. You can see the sort of differences in their, their looks are actually very interesting. And then as we're getting bigger, as we're getting into even larger structures, there's massive jets that shoot out of these big galaxies. There's clusters of galaxies, um, which can be hundreds to thousands of galaxies all embedded in like a cloud of hot gas. And those are the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe. So um, they're really fascinating things to study. And Chandra has spent quite a bit of its 20 plus years being able to research them. And, and some of them, because of gravitational lensing, look like they're smiling back at us. And I do appreciate a cosmic smile, especially over the past year when things were not always so, so fun or enjoyable. So essentially Chandra's story is it's traveled well over two and a half billion kilometers by now. My stats are a little old. I need to update them. Um, about 3000 trips around the earth, over 24, 25 trillion bytes of data collected, 3.6 million lines of code, more than that now, that has been written to operate it, to collect the data, to analyze the data. Essentially, Chandra goes a third of the way to the moon, so we can never visit it in person, like with a servicing mission by astronauts. So any time Chandra has to go to the doctor or any time you have to communicate with Chandra, it's all through coding, lots of different uh, layers of coding. So data is my happy place. I get to, as I said, play with data. Um, the way we are observing the high energy universe is there is this object in space pretty far away from us oftentimes. And that light has been traveling from that object to the Chandra X Observatory, which is pointed at it to observe that light. That light is detected, it's recorded, and then it's essentially wrapped up in the form of ones and zeros, our good friend binary code, and then sent on its way to Earth through NASA's 
deep space network. And eventually that data is making its way to one of our laptops here in New England and it's unpacked. And then that first bit that we get is essentially a table, which is not super exciting, I suppose, but I think they're pretty exciting. Um, the table just maps all of the locations of each photon, each packet of energy that struck the detector um, during the observation. So the uh, X and the Y location, the energy, the time, all of those, you know, bits of sciencey goodness are recorded. And then essentially creating a table, which then we use more software to create the visual representation of the object. And even at that point, there are quite a few steps of processing that have to be done. We have to like go through the data and make sure there's no yucky stuff that has to be removed, any sort of errors that would have to be fixed. Then you have to work on processing your data to make sure you've got the right scaling and the right field of view and aligning it with other data sets, that sort of thing. So it's, it's quite a few steps of data processing to be able to get something that looks like this. Um, and this is a pretty important data set for Chandra, Cassiopeia A, this supernova remnant, this star that exploded about 10,000 light years away from Earth. It is our first light object. It is also an object that's used for calibrating the telescope, essentially. So not only was it one of the first things Chandra ever observed, which Chandra found like amazing, gorgeous, science goodness in that first hour of observation time, but also in the 20 plus years since, as we've collected like 2 million seconds worth of data, you can see the difference that having a light, nice long mission can really make on a data set. When you consider this one on the lower left, that's essentially a few hours of observing time. Um, but now here we've got over this data included about a million seconds worth of observing Question. time. Yeah. Since I'm not, I'm not familiar. I'm also, I'm now also working biomedical data, so I'm not very familiar. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically, what you're trying to do is you're basically trying to reconstruct these pictures, right, from the data. Exactly. So like none of this stuff, we can't see any of this material in X-rays, right? Because yeah, it's human not, eyes it's, can't. Yeah, it's not like photos. <laughs> it's not a photo. These are not space selfies. Right, right, exactly. Right. So, so these are visual representations of a different kind of light that human eyes can't detect. Um, so these images are definitely creations, but of course it's from the science, right? So all of that information was recorded. It's just recorded and it has to be translated into something that we can see. Um, which is what we're looking at here, a translation of it into from X-ray light into a, a, an image that humans can then understand and analyze, um, which I think is really cool. And there's a lot of interesting, I think, overlaps between like biomedical engineering and microscopy, for example, where both areas have to use different kinds of detectors and different kinds of equipment to be able to capture data of things that we can't see natively with human eyes. Um, you often, often need to be able to apply false color in microscopy for many different types of data sets and astronomy has the same thing to deal with. We actually don't like to call it false color because there are definitely people that I, I think feel frustrated by that term because it makes it sound like someone sitting there with crayon and hand coloring it in, right? But we're applying algorithms to this data. We're applying um, software analyses to be able to make sure that what we're doing is um, not only scientifically accurate, but also hopefully well representing of the data. But all that said, when all is said and done, we are humans making choices with our data representation, using software that was built by humans, written by humans, using hardware that was built by humans. So there are, of course, the possibility of biases being wrapped into any data visualization that we create, but there are a lot of checks and balances through this whole process to, to be sure we get as close to um, the true nature of the data as possible. Uh, so yeah, that's a great question. And Again, for me, I love talking about Chandra specifically because not only do I work for it, yes, but also because it's a mission that's been up in space for so long, collecting so much data over time, that gives us a very valuable tool to be able to produce time series data as well, because the universe is changing constantly. It's dynamic. It's not, it's not a still image, right? Everything in the universe is changing all the time and on very interesting time scales. Some of these time scales are super fast and some of these time scales are super slow and i love that like juxtaposition in astronomy right um essentially in astronomy you're like 
a, an armchair time traveler, because everything that you are looking at now, this data that we're getting now, happened many, many, many years ago. So the object that we're looking at for Cassiopeia A, we're seeing it change over time from different releases collected over 2000, 2002, 2004, and 2007. But this is over 10,000 light years away, which means you have to essentially add, it's about 11,000 light years away. So add 11,000 to those dates, right? It's all something that if we were in a spacecraft and could travel out that far right now, which we can't, um, it would not look at all the same. So it's like we get a yearbook, but we only get to look at the baby pictures of the graduating seniors, right? And I think that's actually kind of cool um, because you don't know exactly what it looks like now. So time series data is really exciting, but also my favorite is spatial data. And it's really hard to map spatial data of objects in space that are far away because we're here on earth and we have our perspective. It's almost like a TV screen in a way, right? It's like a very sort of two dimensional sort of thing. So scientists have to get very clever as how to extract that that spectral information to be able to create a 3D model, um, to be able to understand which of the light is moving away from us, uh, which of it is redshifted, or which of that light is moving towards us, which of it is blue shifted. And what we're seeing here is actually the very first 3D model of an exploded star using NASA data. This is our good friend still Cassiopeia A, this, this massive star that exploded many, many years ago. And now we can understand that 3D model of it, um, thanks to Tracy Delaney, who is an amazing colleague. She was working at MIT at the time. And if you're noticing that this looks a bit odd, by the way, um, especially for those in biomedical research, we actually had to use brain imaging software to create this 3D model back in 2008, um, because that's all we had. We had some colleagues at the Center for Astrophysics, where I work, they had like been talking with some brain imaging scientists at some local area um, hospitals in Boston, and they got together to figure out how to use their brain imaging software, a 3D slicer, to be able to import uh, x-ray data, optical data, whatever kind of data in astronomy. And the result was this one of its kind software that we didn't really have anything at the time. Now we do. Now there are many other 3D packages that we can use. Um, but this was really amazing to me and pretty much changed the course of my career. Um, once we had this 3D model, which by the way, lots of cool science came out of it too. You know, we understand how these stars explode differently now because of being able to explore them in 3D. Um, and, you know, it's a beautiful result. You can see where the iron is, you can see where the calcium is, you can see where the silicon and the iron is um, and the argon is all in this 3D space, which is another way of, of learning and researching. Um, but you can also then 3D print it. And for me, 3D printing was like another game changer. We started working with students who are blind or visually impaired to be able to improve these 3D prints so that we could use them with people who don't have the sight that I have to be able to see the data in that way. And it totally changed how I viewed things. Um, such brilliant ideas from the students on how to make them better, how to cut them in half. So a 3D print, you have access to the internal information and the external information if you're exploring it tactily. Um, and lots of other ideas too, that was just, again, phenomenal. Um, and as technologies have developed, we've been able to tap into extended reality as well. So we work now with virtual reality spaces. This is one of my students and she's getting to walk inside this star that exploded over 10,000 light years away. And she can see that green patch, which is the iron, that clump of iron, and she can explore around it. And it's a very interesting way to be able to learn and try something new. We can bring it into augmented reality, we, so you can do it in your office. We can bring it into a hologram, so you can have a display. Um, it is a new way of being able to process this data and understand it either on the scientific side or for enjoyment and learning side. Um, and then during the pandemic, all those, you know, all those data, all the 3D prints and the virtual reality and that stuff became really difficult. So how do we communicate with our, our communities and um, learners and researchers when we're all stuck at home? How do we get across the science that we're doing every day? Well, we had some very good colleagues that were very talented, um, Matt Russo and Andrew Santaguida from System Sounds, who we started working with to be able to translate into sound. 
So again, it's another way of exploring the data, both on a scientific side, but also on a communication side. And I'm just actually not, I'm not thinking, I did not see a share sound button when I logged in. So let me know, can you hear this? No, no, you can't I think hear you it. To, I think you have to turn the volume up on right. your a computer and then right. we'll be able to hear it. I have done it before. All right, let me try that. Anything? Yeah, yeah, I could hear something, but not it's not very loud. So maybe try right. I will post the URLs for you to listen afterwards so you can explore it on your own. But what I thought was actually really interesting is, you know, we worked on this. Oh, here comes my cat. That always happens. Um, <laughs> Um, space cats are a thing. So um, what I thought was really interesting about this project is we did it, this is embarrassing, we did it with the idea of being able to work with our community members that we had been working with already in the 3D world, so the 3D prints and virtual reality and all that. Um, and hope specifically that people who are blind or low vision or different learners would have a, a way to keep continuing to, um, you know, receive this, this cutting edge data, but what it turned into was this viral result that I was totally shocked by. And I don't know if it was because it was the pandemic and we were all needing a little bit of light or entertainment, or I don't know what it was, but um, within about a week and a half or two weeks of, of releasing our first collection of these data sonifications, these translations of information to sound. We had like 2 million listens on the NASA SoundCloud. We had um, hundreds of news articles and podcasts came up and it was just such an overwhelming positive response um, that I, I was taken very much by surprise and obviously very happily so. So now it's a, a program that we have incorporated into our everyday work. You know, if we're working on some data uh, visualization or representation, we consider all the possibilities. Like, does this work best in 3D? Do we have the data to support that? Is this better as a time series? Can we translate it into sound? Can we make a tactile representation? Um, it's, a, it's a fun way to be able to like squeeze as much lemon juice out of your lemons of data, right? That, that you can. So, so yeah, sonification has been yet another turning point for me. I think there's lots of people doing fascinating research in it, um, actually using sonification to improve scientific research and also understanding how people then receive uh, that idea of sound as a representation of science. And there have been some really great studies that have shown that people can learn to become really good listeners. Like the human sense of hearing is usually pretty good. So if you're at a you know, pre-pandemic cocktail party, you can hear the person talking next to you. You can hear someone speaking across the room. You can hear the sounds of people eating in another room. Like there's a really great um, issue in, in human hearing for that, that signal to noise ratio that we're able to overcome. So the work on that is, is fantastic that this is being used in many different fields, not just astronomy, um, but other fields as well across different kinds of, of science um, topics and areas of study. So again, all of that, all of this stuff that I just showed you, it's all from the same ones and zeros. By the way, this series of ones and zeros that you're looking at is actually a tiny clip of all the ones and zeros that went into that CASUPA data set. So this is just a tiny, tiny little snippet of the millions and millions of lines of ones and zeros that we have overall. But it's just a way I think of demonstrating the possibilities that we have to be able to uh, code and process our data in, in new ways. So, you know, this, this was definitely not a one and done for us. We've, we've done this type of work on a number of other objects in the universe from pulsars, um, both through 3D mapping and sonification to other kinds of exploding stars like supernova remnant 1987A, um, many different techniques that we've been trying to, um, I don't know why that showed up like that, um, to be employ to be able to make the representation of this data better. So um, it's been a true journey to be able to experience all of these different things and to, again, like see the emotional response. We actually conducted a study not that long ago and we that somehow we got 4,500 responses for the survey, which I was 
again, flabbergasted by because I feel like most people hate to take surveys. <laughs> you know, if, like the Home Depot sends me a survey. I don't want to take it. Um, but 4,500 very kind souls took our, our, our survey and gave us a lot of fantastic data specific to the data sonifications. And not only was there an emotional response that is very prevalent in, in those um, data, but also an interesting thing occurred that we were able to see that by listening to the universe, people became, in general, more aware that other people on Earth can experience the universe in different ways. Um, so again, it was just an interesting way to be able to show that sometimes you create something for a small group and you're hoping that it makes the experience better for them. But what you're also doing is improving access for other people as well. And that idea of trying to incorporate, you know, like universal design so that it's not excluding anyone, but hopefully including more people more purposefully. Um, that's my goal. It's hard to do that. Obviously it takes a lot of effort. You have to have good data. Um, but I don't remember, I don't remember what time I actually started. I thought I would just end on a positive note that even though we've gone pretty far in our trip through the universe so far this evening, um, back here on earth, what's really interesting to me too, is that all of that hard work to make the Chandra mission, to launch it, to, um, get to even where Chandra was lots of precursor telescopes had to happen before we could get a Chandra, all of that technology that had to be developed to get where we are today to be able to understand the X-ray universe gives us so many benefits here on Earth. And I went like 15 years, maybe more, um, working for Chandra before I actually knew that as I'm going through an airport pre-pandemic, um, airport security has been improved because of X-ray technology. So simple. Quality control and manufacturing. So when I'm shopping at at the grocery store, the quality control and manufacturing for those food items and other items have been improved because of X-ray telescopes like Chandra. Um, medicines and how those are created, biomedical research, energy research. Um, when I get a mammogram every year, because I have a risk factor, that mammogram has been made higher resolution and safer because of the Chandrix Observatory. If anyone's ever had to get an MRI, MRIs have been made higher resolution and um, lower dosage because of the Chandrix Observatory. Other things in lithography, microscopy, low current magnets, environmental monitoring, all of these things that um, you know, some of these aspects touch our lives every day, and I had no idea, and I work for the telescope. Um, so I like to just kind of end on that way to sort of bring it back to Earth. You know, not only is the iron in our blood and the calcium in our bones from previous generations of stars that Chandra's getting to look at, um, but also that sort of everyday um, improvement to technology here on Earth. Um, it's also had an impact from, from telescope like Chandra. So that is our high energy universe in a nutshell, in a very brief nutshell. Um, I hope you enjoyed that voyage. As I said, when, when you're working in astronomy, you are essentially an armchair time traveler. So you have all been time travelers with me this evening as well. And I, I hope you enjoyed your trip through the thousands, if not millions and billions of light years that, that we got to take. So yeah. Um, just some notices where my funding comes from. And if you're interested in any of these projects, all of the sonifications that I mentioned, they can be found at chandra.si.edu slash sound. If you have a 3D printer, please feel free to go to chandra.si.edu slash tactile. If you have a VR equipment or a smartphone, we have most of our VR applications we've adapted for smartphones these days. Um, oh, this is an old slide. I, I did give a talk at South by Southwest, but who cares? That was like months ago. So anyways, um, that I, that's the end. I thought we could go to questions if anyone has a question. Um, I wondered if you could um, go back to the slide with with the um, um, the three D printing because I noticed sure. there were like different colors and so I wanted to know if if they <laughs> oops sorry that's my dog that's okay um, it didn't make my dog bark so that's, the only, that's the only thing I would worry about anyway she I don't think she noticed but anyway no I just wondered how you if if those different colors had different um what's the word um I'm sorry 
my brain's dead. But no, if they have if they have different textures, because they were different colors, and I wondered if you had if you use different textures with them. That's my first question. So I have many more, but I mean, all right. So what we're looking at now is one of the first three color 3D prints we're able to do because most of the 3D prints that we've been doing for a long time are just the one color PLA filaments like in a Ultimaker or a MakerBot type of thing. Um, and those are, you know, obviously cheaper and easier to do, but because this 3D model has so much science -y goodness crammed into it, right? When we look at where the iron is, for example, in this version, it's the green. Now that's very interesting because when a star is running out of fuel and getting ready to collapse, a massive star, um, the iron is at its core. And so somehow um, when a star explodes, the iron that was at the very core right before it exploded is somehow now you can see all along the perimeter. It's it's clumped, you know, way farther out. So a star like Cassiopeia A literally turns itself inside out when it explodes. So you can map that in the 3D model and show it very clearly. So once we sort of figured out the basics of 3D printing with a single color PLA, our next thing that we wanted to target was this idea of multicolor 3D printing, which at the time was very expensive and difficult, but now it's gotten much, much easier. Um, and so here, what we're looking at is those color representations. And yes, we actually had um, a designer on staff who went in with like, I don't actually know how she did it, but she like applied some sort of light dusting of like texture somehow um, to those various colors by hand afterwards, because we couldn't do that as part of the 3D printing process. Um, this version that we're looking at right here was from a powder printer, which I don't love to be honest, because the powder printers, um, the end results, even if you do the, the epoxy or whatever it's called after, um, they don't hold very well and if it's going to be handled it, it does need to hold very well so this is more like a display thing um, which is great and has its purposes but we couldn't add texture to the 3d powder printer so what we did was did it by hand after the fact so the the iron was like a clumpier texture um, the silicon was smooth um, the argon and the neon were like kind of like uh, i don't know like more sandpapery um, and that was hopefully a way to be able to help communicate those different um, chemical elements and, and their location, particularly to people who are, are blind or, or visually impaired. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, and now, to be honest, we do actually send a lot of our 3D prints out to companies to be able to do because, shush, I don't know. No, no, sorry. Um, you know, the joys of working from home, pets, first the cat, now the dog. My it's teenagers okay. are great, okay. but. It's okay. My dog is completely asleep and does not even notice. Oh, it's so funny. Um, let me try to shush her really quick. Hold on. Um, I think she's done. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, so it's 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 definitely been a, a journey to be able to like figure all of those those details out and to you know. For, for a long time, we had to figure out how to do all the 3D printing ourselves, and it did become onerous by when the program started getting popular. So being able to use some of the new um, companies that do all the, the production for you at a relatively decent cost um, has been very helpful be, being able to upscale our production and, and, and help serve more people. So, um, all right. So more questions. I think I have to stop share to see the questions in the chat, but... Um, oh, Victoria, you saw that program. Okay, that's so cool. Um, thank you so much. I'm glad that you got to see that. I, I just, I loved working with the Museum of Natural History on that program. I personally, as you can probably tell, enjoy um, including new ways of understanding or experiencing something. So being able to incorporate dance from the sounds um, of, the, of the Galactic Center was just really fun. And as a former dancer way, way, way long ago, um, I really, I really enjoyed that program. So thank you so much for noting that. Any other questions? I just wondered, so I think that the star that we were looking at was Cassiopeia A, am I wrong? Yeah. My BFF, yep. 
Can you give us an idea of the scale? Of oh, that? yes, <laughs> yes. I always say that. I can't believe I didn't say that. Yeah. So um, the interesting thing is that 3D prints, the first one I showed you, the single color is like a four inch version, right? But in real life, it's about 400 million billion times the surface area of our sun and planets. And you can toss in Pluto if you're like a weird Pluto diehard fan, because at the math, it doesn't matter. So scale wise, this is enormous right so this star explodes it vomits its guts out all over the universe and that material slowly dissipates out out and out before eventually it's like swept up into new generations of stars of hopefully planets or people um so that that idea of recycling i think is is just fantastic so it's very massive and very not dense um as it's doing that but we're seeing it you know all from our vantage point on earth as it was a long time ago and all kind of like smushed into a 2d image which is again why i really appreciate the 3d model um and part of the reason we started working with virtual reality and augmented reality was also to help that idea of scale because even though you can never approach the scales obviously of the universe, those scales are ridiculous. Um, it is helpful. There's been some, some research done by, I think, Matthew Schnapps. Um, it is helpful to be able to have these larger than computer screen size representations of data because it does help the researcher and the non-expert think of these things in new ways. Um, and I think that's also really, really fascinating that these tools of exploring this information, they're not just cool, gee whiz, but they do help the science and they do help the communication of the science. And there's a lot of work that still needs to be done uh, to further cement that, but I think a truly large amount of potential there. And um, I just wondered if, sorry, I'm, I'm, if anyone else has questions, please interrupt. But anyway, I just wondered about the results from your, from your survey. Do you have any preliminary anything? Like what did, you know, I mean, I know you kind of briefly went over it and I just wondered if you could give me more details or. Yeah, so the sonification survey, specifically that one. Yeah, so we are in the process of analyzing it now. Um, but what I can say is that the enjoyment levels were very high. And what we did, we did a two by two setup um, of both people who are sighted and people who are blind or visually impaired, as well as um, expert, non-expert differences within that too. So we had like a, you know, a grid of four different audiences that we were um, looking for results. And thankfully, because we got such a high number of response, we did have enough data to be able to do that two by two grid. Um, but essentially what we found is that across all the audiences that we surveyed, the enjoyment was really high. Uh, the learning value was actually really high. And the like, I want to know more because of this type of thing was also really high, which was great to see. But I truly think the most exciting result that I got out of that was the the sort of surprise one that I mentioned earlier in the talk, the idea that people who listened to the sonifications and then you know took the survey were thinking about how people experience the universe as a result. And I I just think that's a really special result, and I'm 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 hoping that plays out really well in the data versus just the the preliminary analysis. Um, I think it will, but we'll we'll have to see. So, can, can you just explain a little bit more what exactly that means? They're thinking about how people experience. How so it was more like an awareness that not everybody is going to see the universe, that there are other ways of knowing and other ways of understanding. So someone that is blind, for example, is not going to see the image like he or she does, but has to experience it in some other way. Um, and that I think awareness was just a surprise. Um, I, I just didn't expect that to, to happen. So I have a fan on because it's so hot and I my hair is blowing in my face. Um, I kind of feel like I'm in a music video though with this background. It's a little weird. So anyways, yeah, so that was that was really exciting and 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 more on that hopefully soon. So okay, I don't know if anyone else has any questions. I have a question like what um so you said you used to use um sort of like brain imaging software right and so what do you what do you use now do you use matlab <laughs> do you use I mean, people use matlab for processing biomedical i don't usually work i, I don't work a lot in imaging so yeah like, no not matlab no we do I, so it depends so there have been 
like different tracks of getting these 3D data. Um, and one track is like pure data into 3D model through something like Blender, through something like 3D Slicer, through something like um, ShapeX, all of these new, um, there's a Houdini um, software that's that's also great. So there, there are all of these new different software packages that astronomers have at their disposal now, which is fantastic. Um, but there's also another side of this that comes from the um, hydrodynamic simulation world so where you know they're doing a simulation and running the mathematical modeling through any number of different mathematical um, uh, software and, and algorithms and all that but then they constrain it with the actual observations to be able to get a more complete picture of how it fits in the observed phenomena or observed whatever um, and we've been finding these days like a lot more happening in that world um, it just seems like there's just a really good synergy going on oh that's kind of a vomit word but you know what I mean like a, a really nice coalescing of the people that are working to create all of those data simulations and then adding all of the actual observational data that telescopes like Chandra have provided over 20 something years um, so that's been exciting because we have dozens of these objects which doesn't sound like a lot considering there's like you know trillions upon trillions of objects in the universe but based on how hard it is I am super excited that we have dozens of these 3D models at this point. So yeah, that's a great question. Any other questions? Have I fatigued you all with our universe? Um, hope you enjoyed the trip. Victoria, do you have any questions you wanna ask? Her mic doesn't work, she told us earlier. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Victoria, if you have any questions, you can type them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. And I really have so much pressure. Yes, exactly. Think of something fun quick. Usually I get like an alien question. So, you know, it's always, I was wondering about the music choices. Okay. Yeah. So on the data sonifications, um, there are different ways to do data sonification and you can do just like a real straight up, like, you know, uh, assign your pixels uh, like one single piano note or one single synthesized sound and just map the location of those pixels, for example. Um, you have, there's there's a, a number of different software pieces that can do that kind of very basic data sonification for mostly scientific analysis, but also for people who want to try it on their own. However, we wanted to try something a little different with our data sonification project. So the way we started out was to take a, a data set like the Galactic Center, for example, the, the center of the Milky Way, and map different sounds to different kinds of light. So we had, for example, in our image of the Milky Way, let me bring it up because I feel like it might be easier to explain um, if I can show something. Yeah. Okay. So in this part of my screen that we're looking at now, this image has three different kinds of light in it. It's got um, the x-ray light, which is the highest energy. That's the blue stuff. Primarily, there's a little light greenish color in there too, or like purplish color. Um, the optical or technically like near infrared light from the Hubble Space Telescope, and that's the gold. And then the infrared data, which is the coolest uh, gas and dust, and that is the red. So we knew we had this map of all this data. It was a long image. So we wanted to run the data sonification horizontally across the image. At the very um, far right is that bright white spot. And that's the supermassive black hole where there's all of this, the white is like all the data stacked together. A lot of activity is happening there. We wanted that to be apparent. So what we did, and again, this is the brilliance of uh, the colleagues that I've worked with at System Sounds who happen to be musicians. I am not a musician. I'm a, a band geek from way long ago and a former choir geek, but like not really a musician musician. Um, and they have like actual musical training. So what we did was select sounds that would best represent the data 
together. So the highest pitch that um, the, the highest energy sound would be mapped to the xylophone. The medium energy sound was like the plucky violin. And then the lowest energy sounds was a soft piano because they played really well together. So it helped communicate all of those bits and pieces in the data sets well. You could hear them, you could distinguish them when they're together in a symphony, or you could hear them and understand them as little mini solos. So it truly has been a choice. So just like the colors that I selected when making this image like 10 something years ago, I chose the color of bluish purple to represent highest energy because you know in physics that's kind of how it is um, and the lowest energy to represent red. I could have chosen green, orange and you know poop brown if I wanted to. Like you can choose different colors. Um, but when you're making those choices, you're trying to help represent the science data in the best way possible and also have something that you're happy with at the end. So the selection of those colors made sense for the data. Similarly, the selection of those sounds made sense for the science and the end result of the piece that we were listening to. So for us, for our data sonification so far, each one has been a an intentional understanding of the data that we have the science that we're trying to communicate and the fact that we want the end result to make sense specifically to people who are blind or visually impaired we test it with some of our colleagues and some of our friends that are blind or visually impaired but also be enjoyable be something that you want to listen to um, so that's a long winded explanation of, of how we make those choices, but hopefully that helps. Um, and that's also, by the way, not to say anything bad about a simple like, you know, take one note and assign it and map an image where the pixels are in that image. We do that too for other purposes. Um, but for this, this specific project, we wanted to go a little bit beyond that and really, really showcase the data. You're so welcome, <laughs> my quiet friend. It's great to have you. <laughs> yeah, cool. So they, I don't think we have any other questions unless we want to put a little bit more pressure on Victoria. But I think, <laughs> <laughs> well, this this was actually really fun, and I, I hope some of your your users in your group get to to watch the video after the fact. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. It was, it was fun. I'm sure they will because it's a very interesting. I mean, you know, this is a really fascinating talk. I'm, I'm really, you know, I don't know if I'm totally entranced. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I did my job with at least one person. So thank you. <laughs> awesome. Great. Well, yeah, it was so nice to be here. So everyone have a good night and uh, 